I don't just want your knowledge. I don't just want your memorization. All of those things are important. It must be disconnected with your whole life. Connected to your whole life, not disconnected from your whole life. Um, guys, Jesus wants all of you. He reigns forevermore. I don't know if y'all know it or not, but he reigned before time started. He'll reign after time ends. He's just going to reign because that's who he is. And so we can celebrate that, the victory that we have in Jesus. Y'all all right being in church this morning? Yeah. And how many of you went to go see The Forge? Y'all yeah. see your boy? It's a good movie about discipleship and the impact that we are called to make. And so I'm excited for that. Let me start with a word of prayer. We're just going to jump right in. Heavenly Father, we love you and honor you. We give you the praise and glory for who you are. Lord, right now I'm compelled to lift up the Burks family. Uh, a member of our church. A, uh, and Lord, right now we just pray for your comfort. It's hard, it's hard and I'm sure they are asking the question why and all of those things, Lord. Um, but remind them that we don't mourn as those with no hope in their sadness and grieving. Um, that you have him and he's in a better place. That he's home. In this crazy world, Lord, just keep our minds fixed on Jesus. That's our hope. And our salvation is in Christ alone. So we pray for them. We pray that they realize they're not alone, that the family of believers, the church would surround them. And, uh, and we're just so thankful in these moments for the word victory. Lord, we pray that you bless your word, bless your members today as we learn more about you. And we'll be careful to give you the glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right, turn to the book of Matthew, verse 22, chapter 22, verse 35 through 40. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Matthew 22, verse 35 through 40. It says, one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend the whole law and the prophets. You may be seated. Today I want to talk to you from the title, Back to the Basics. Back to the Basics. Here you have the Pharisees and Sadducees in context of this chapter asking Jesus questions in order to trip him up. This is a group of smart gentlemen who have prided themselves on their understanding and knowledge of the, the law and the Ten Commandments and 613 statutes and ordinances. And one of them who is a lawyer, which means he's proficient in law, comes and sits down and tests him and says, which is the greatest and foremost commandment? In other words, there's a lot of these commandments. Tell us which one you would put first. Put them in order so that we can understand what you think is the greatest out of all of them. And so he's setting to trip Jesus up for him to make one law more special than another and do all of those different things. And he's trying to test him. This is actually what trips up a lot of believers, though. Because a lot of believers are trying to figure out, what should I do first? 
Where should I start? Let me figure out the list where I can move the spiritual needle forward in my life. Let me figure out how I'm supposed to do this. We're a part of the how-to generation. Y'all spend a lot of y'all's time on YouTube watching how-to videos so that you can figure stuff out on how are you supposed to do stuff. So we're the how-to generation and we're trying to figure out what is the list or metric or rubric or blueprint so that I can do this right and get the most out of this. And that how-to generation still hasn't figured out how to live the Christian life consistently. And so he's trying to trip Jesus up by asking him the how-to or put this in order for me. What is the most important in the law? And Jesus said, now remember, this is the Pharisees and Sadducees, right? This is some smart dudes. And they're looking for something deep. And Jesus, I can imagine him standing up and saying, repeat after me, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. He took them jokers to Awana. (laughs) I'm sure they were expecting some historical context, some you know, ethical teachings, philosophical elaborations, ritualistic observations, like give us something. This is a smart group, kind of like an ordination that he was at where they were testing him, trying to see what he knows and what he was going to bring to the table. And when the lawyer came and said, which one is the greatest? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. What? Basically, if we don't get back to the basics, your Christian life will always be basic. Evidently, God is not looking for rule followers. He's looking for followers that rule, and there's a difference. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. He's not interested in contractors of the faith. He's looking for people who are going to be full time. Contractors, you know, they do what they do. They come in, but they don't have to be committed. Now, if there's any contractors of our church, we love doing business with you. (laughs) Continue to do so. But a lot of Christians get tripped up trying to figure out what's most important, what's least important, put it in a pot, stir it together, and hope they can come out with something good enough. This isn't spiritual jambalaya. This is following Jesus. And he's not giving them a list of what's most important and how you do it and where you should start. He just tells them, love the Lord your God. He did not want to talk about law. He wanted to talk about love. He didn't want to talk about a list. He wanted to talk about a whole life. He didn't want to talk about your rituals. He wanted to talk about relationships. He didn't want to talk about your performance. He wants to talk about your passion. You can never, trust me, become a disciple unleash unless you're no longer on the law's leash. Now, trust me when I tell you the law is good. It's a good thing. Romans 7.12 says the law is righteous and holy and good. But in Philippians 3, 8 and 9, Paul says, but knowing Christ is to the greater. That I counted all my fleshly, um, not just desires, but the things that I've accomplished due to my flesh, I counted all as rubbish in comparison to knowing Christ. So you understand that, yes, the law is good, but knowing Christ is greater. And once you understand that knowing Christ is greater, then 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, now you are a competent minister that can go out and teach other people about the new covenant, which knowing Christ will get them following the law. And once you realize that the law is good and that knowing Christ is greater and then you become a competent minister to be able to perpetuate that new covenant, then you can serve and be unleashed, no longer bound by the written code, the Bible says. 
In other words, him telling them to love the Lord their God is a mouthful. If I could just get my people to love me. Um, I know you want a blessing from me. I know you need me. I'm talking about love me. People want guidance, but they don't want the guide. They want direction, but they reject the way. He said, no, I'm, I'm talking about you actually loving me. Okay, now, picture this. Now that you've seen the forge, you know I like acting, so. Picture Jesus at the table with the Pharisees, and they're smart. Um, they pride themselves on their memorization skills and understanding of the Old Testament and the law. And they sit down with him, and they say, what is the greatest law? And after asking that question from the astute lawyer, you can imagine all of them leaning in to see what he was going to say. And Jesus said, love me. Y'all don't get it. Okay. Ooh, okay, there's a group of Pharisees and Sadducees who pride themselves on their knowledge and understanding of law and the memorization of the Old Testament. And they ask him, what's the greatest commandment? And they all lean in waiting for the astute answer. And Jesus says, love me. Okay, man. come on, man. Okay, y'all supposed to get this. Uh, let me try one more time. Uh, it's a group of Pharisees. And they ask, which is the greatest command? And they've got the knowledge and memorization skills, and they got the Bible, like, memorized. And they all lean in for the answer. You know what Jesus said? I need you to do the thing you don't have. Love me. You got all that knowledge and you missed the entire thing. It's an indictment answer on who he's talking to. He's telling the Pharisees, you missed the whole game. And you know all that? You're playing the game without the ball. You don't love me. The Pharisees, people who, uh, these are people who like themselves. They know a lot and they know they know a lot but it's totally disconnected from the love of Christ. They're like the butchers of the faith. That's the only reason why they pick up the sword. These are the people, you know when you leave a social media video and they're in the comments and they're only in the comments to talk about how bad your video was? Or something you said that was off. Or they sit in church and they're only listening to dig into what you missed. They're not here to learn and grow. They're here to think about how smart they are. And Jesus says, yeah, but you don't love me. I understand that you know all this, but disconnected from love, you missed the entire game. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't know the word. You should. The Bible says meditate on my word day and night. But not so that you can just be smart and like yourself. Not so that you can pray loud, nice prayers that everybody can hear with the vicissitudes and all of that kind of stuff. He don't care about none of that. He's standing sitting, and he looks at the Pharisees, and he says, I know that that's you, 
I can tell by the way you pay your tithes. You do it because you know you should, but you don't love me. I can tell by the way you serve and give. You do it because you've been in church long enough to know you should, but you don't love me. You know what to do, you know what to say, you know how to play the game. The entire indictment on the person who asked the question was, disconnected from all of that knowledge is love, and it all doesn't matter if love is not involved. So I want you to learn I want you to grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ and read his word, but not to show off. Guy came to me, asked the question, so what do you think about Revelations when it says, and I could tell by his posture, once you start pulling on your shirt and you start buttoning, you start doing all that. And he was talking about the, the, you know, the bowls and the trumpet, you know what I'm saying? And, this is, and so he's asking the question, then start telling me what he thinks. And I could tell, I was just like, and, and my, I, the whole time I'm like, come on, bro. So we finished asking the question, and I said, tell me about your relationship with your wife. I said, what they got to do with the bowls and the trumpets? I, I want to know, do you love your wife? I want to know, do you take care of your kids? I want to know, do you sit around the table and talk to them about them bowls and them trumpets? Don't, don't, don't come to me with, I'm not with all that. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm not. Jesus could smell them. I want to know if you love me. This is, this is the basics of the faith. He took them to Awana to bring them all the way back to playing the game with the actual ball. So, so how do you love him? Well, he tells you, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. The heart is the central location for life. Spiritually speaking, it's the central location of the overwhelming desire to radically live for or follow Jesus. It is the desire within a person. I used to have coaches who would say, that boy or that girl got heart. They're not talking about the science. They're not even talking about whether they're good at it. They're not talking about their training. They're talking about their passion in the game. In other words, it's evident, and then they'll say, that's not something you can teach. I I can't even coach that. Like, I, I want that kid, I could teach that kid Because their heart in which they play the game, they value the game. And you can tell. My dad would always say, are Christians destroying America? Because they leave the church and they don't play with no heart. Yeah, they like debates and all of those things, social media, let's do all these debates. But do you have, people can see hearts. Remember when I was in a um, playing for Baylor? Let me talk about myself for a second. I was playing for Baylor. We had a conditioning test, and the conditioning test was six three hundreds with thirty seconds rest. Y'all, y'all like like that's normal. That is not <laughs> six three hundreds, and you only get to rest for thirty seconds. That's not normal. So this was our summer conditioning. I stayed home. Um, I stayed at the house for the first half of the summer conditioning because it wasn't mandatory. So I said, I'm going to come later. I got a call and my boys were like, bro, you're going to die. <laughs> like, you're not here working out. You're not here getting trained. Like, he's teaching us how to run it, how you're supposed to do all of those different things. And I said, well, what is it? They said six 300s with 30 seconds rest. Now, the way they were running it is they were running a lap around the outskirt of the football field that equaled 300 yards. He didn't tell me that. All I knew was I wasn't going to show up and look like a fool. I was going to make my time. So I took my stopwatch, wrapped it around my hand, went up to Duncanville High School by myself and started running 300s. The way that I ran them was wrong. 
I ran, they ran one continuous lap. I didn't know any better. So I ran 100 yards, stopped, turned around, ran 100 yards, stopped like a suicide, and then ran back 100 yards. Do y'all know how hard it is to stop and build your speed back up, then run a continuous lap? I didn't know any better. I didn't have the training. All I knew was is I had a desire to win. So when I came to the summer workouts, and they was like, bro, you gonna die. I got on the line, I started running, and, and as I was running, I said, are we just running around the field? <laughs> and I got back after number one, I was like, okay. Then we got to number two, we got to number three. At number three, I'm still standing there, and they like this. And I said, oh, I'm gonna make it. <laughs> we got to number four, I got a little bit more tired, but then the boys were like, he might make it. <laughs> and when you get to two left, when you only have two left, you got to make it. Like, you, you got to make it. So we got to number six. There was two guys ahead of me, and I started, you know, picking up. It's my last one. And I heard the coach say, that boy got heart. You can't coach that. We finished. I made the time. Six guys made it out of 60. I went down to the other field, and the coach was so mad that the people who trained couldn't make the goal, he made them run six more. I know. <laughs> and he looked at them and said, how y'all got the training and you couldn't meet the goal? It's because he got heart. And a lot of people have been running for a long time and you still missing the goal because you ain't got no heart and you're still trying to figure out the Christian life and you're still trying to figure out based on training how you're supposed to do it and what's the rubric and what's the list and what's the law. And Jesus is like, give me your heart. And once you give me your heart, that changes the entire game. The Pharisees had it in their head, but they didn't have it in their heart. Let me tell you about the disciples. Acts 4.13 says, they were untrained men, but they knew they had been with Jesus. The Pharisees didn't change anything. The disciples, 12 of them, changed the world. And what happens when you have 22 to 2,500 people who can leave church with the heart that has been given to Jesus Christ? If 12 can change the world, we can at least change the community. The problem is we've been satisfied with being the salt to the shaker and not the salt to the world. So we come to church and we learn, woo, that was a good sermon, and we leave with the same stale heart that still hadn't fallen in love with Jesus. He sat down with the Pharisees and he said, I, I got your brain. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get your heart. That's the law. Oh, and you look good, but I don't care about that. He said when he was choosing David, man looks at the outer appearance. I don't. I look at the heart. You look cute and pretty and handsome, all the things. And that's nice for us. Jesus said, love me. Do you have heart? And many of us, just like me, for a long time, I thought I loved him, but I didn't. I list him or law him. And yet we get it confused when we list him or law him because it's a, it's a very, it's, just like a, it's like this little line where we do so that God will respond instead of responding to what God has done. This is very, this is just my gratitude and my response. I, I love him. I'm not trying to enlist him. He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. That's the unleashed part. I, you can't teach that. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, beating desire. Do -do and all your soul. 
while your heart gives life, the soul is positioned to perpetuate the life that you have. The heart is the inner beating desire on the inside. The soul is the disposition that will parade that desire around on the outside. In other words, the soul is your temperament, your personality, your personhood. It, it is your character. It, it is you. Sing it with me. Repeat after me. It is well with my soul. Okay, sing it together. It is well with my soul. My brother was here first service. He was like, oh, don't do that. I can see him like this in first service. That's not your gift. You... He told me when I was little, he said, you got an A ear, but a D voice. Like you can hear it, but you can't execute what you hear. It don't matter. But when you, when you sang that, you can feel that. It's well with my soul. That's it. What you're saying is I'm okay. I, I'm at peace. I'm going to be all right because it's well with who I am. That's why Matthew 10, 28 says, fear not the ones who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul because the soul, that's who you are. The, 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 the body without the soul is just an empty shell. The soul still lives on. And so the soul is who you are. So when he says, the Pharisee says, which one is the greatest law? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your desire, all of your beating desire from the inside. And then he says, give me your whole soul. I want all of you, not just your head knowledge, not just your ability to put on fig leaves to cover yourselves up in front of people. I want your whole soul. I want your will, your time. I want your talents, your past experiences, your future aspirations. I want your positioning and your posture. I want your whole soul. I want the heart of the man or the woman. I want the whole soul of the man or the woman. That's more than going to church. That's having that thing live inside of you. In other words, when you repent, you repent with a heart and a soul. Not just, I'm sorry, he'll forgive me, it's that grace thing. When someone loves somebody and they're sorry, that's a whole different level of repentance. Here's your answer. Back to the basics. If I can just get my people to love me, Hallelujah. disciples unleashed would be no problem. It would be their whole life, not a calculated list when they pick and choose when they're going to do it or not. If I had their whole soul, then their whole disposition would be set to carry out the desire that's beating from the heart. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and all of your mind. Oh, well, this brings it all together. we got a desire. We have a disposition. Now we go do. Because the mind makes you do. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is acceptable, perfect, and good. Now we're going to prove the will of God because what's coming from my desire and my disposition is now being worked out in my mind, my whole self. I don't just want your knowledge. I don't just want your memorization. All of those things are important. It must be disconnected with your whole life, connected to your whole life, not disconnected from your whole life. Um, guys, Jesus wants all of you. I can't say it more simplistic than he said it. They just couldn't hear it because they're Pharisees. 
their whole goal was not the sermon. Their whole goal was to try to trip the sermon up. They're, they're, they weren't there to listen, learn. And he said, love the Lord your God. Ah. Oh. They didn't even know who they were talking to. The whole thing is an indictment on who's asking the question. Love the Lord your God. Um, by the way, I'm him. And some of us come to church not knowing where we're at. He's him. But we haven't given us to him. And he wants all of us, your mind, your heart, your soul, to prove what the will of God is. That which is acceptable, perfect, and good. Okay, so how do you get there? How do you get to the place where you just, you just are in there? You just love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You want to know how you get there? The same way you get a tan. You go sit in the sun. You see, see, you are waiting for another how-to, like a list of functions that you need to do to try to figure out how to love God and how to figure out. No, you go sit in the sun and you get dark. That's how it works. It's the effect of who he is, not the effect of who you are. You keep trying to figure out what you're going to do. No, go be in his presence and watch him burn on you. I know people who are negative. You know why they're negative? They dwell in it. They can't see the cup half full. It's just half empty. They, they can't see anything positive. They only want to talk about the negative. They can only see what's wrong. They can never bring up what's good. Like their whole mentality has been skewed to the negative because they live there. People who are in living in anxiety because they dwell in fear. And you spend your time trying to pick them up. Like, no, see it this way. Understand, like, like you, nothing to be afraid. Like, you're doing all of this, and they just can't get out of the woods. Because they're living there. You dwell in victory, and it, it builds your countenance and confidence. You dwell in gratitude, and it builds up your joy. But you can't. You can't go be in the sun and stay inside. Okay. Um, that also means, be in the sun also means a change of location. And this is the hard part. Because uh, you don't want to turn off your social media. You don't want to change your people. You want to stay inside and get the sun. No, you have knowledge of the sun, but you don't get the effects of the sun until you go outside. You, you can't be in the same place and not be the same person. It says, well, I, I need you to, if I can just get my people to love me, not try to enlist me, but love me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he says, they'll, they'll be, it'll be evident because you'll then be able to love your neighbor as yourself. I hate to say it, but... Uh, Some church people can be some of the ugliest. I mean, immediately. Just mean. And just left worship. Just left listening to the sermon. 
They came to church, and as soon as someone bugged them, <laughs> flipped their lid. I thought you loved me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, now here's the uh, misinterpretation of this verse is I'm going to love people the way I want to be loved. No. I know, because I used to think about it the same way. I used to think, well, great. This works for me, so it must work for you. Now, if you've been married for any time at all, <laughs> or in a relationship, you know that don't work. Have y'all know the uh, five love languages? Y'all read that book, seen that? That's... Uh, if I tried to love Kanika based on my love languages, that ain't going to work. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm touching words of affirmation. You know, she's service, which is her highest one in quality time. So if I loved her the way that I want to be loved, she wouldn't be getting what she needs. I can't assume that the way I want to be treated is the way she wants to be treated. Matter of fact, because I'm a fallible person, I should never use the way I want to be loved as the rubric for loving anybody. That's not, really, that's not really how that works. When he says, love your neighbor as yourself, he's reverting back to God, not you. Love your neighbor as much as I know you wanted to be loved by me. Okay. You don't want to forgive, but didn't you need forgiveness? Amen. You don't want to give mercy, but isn't that how you wanted me to love you? You didn't deserve grace, but didn't you need that from me? He's saying, I know exactly how you want to be loved. Now love them like that. Why? Because his love is not fallible. His love is perfect, true, and good. So you revert back to what he gave you, and then you give that to everyone else. A disciple who is unleashed, a disciple is a visible verbal follower of Jesus Christ. Not their own history, their own rubric of love, how they were raised, what they think is good. You're not a disciple of you, you're a disciple of him. So what you're doing is carrying out who he is, not who you are. I want you to love the Lord your God. Why? Because of how he loved you first. And then you turn around and you give it to others. And then things begin to change. Things begin to morph. You say, well, well we're not Jesus. We can't do it perfectly. Well, he knows that. And at the same time still says, be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord. He does not coach you based on your ability. He coaches you based on his standard. Back to the forge. Which is the greatest command? Love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's first and foremost, and the second is much like it. You turn and you love your neighbor the way I loved you as yourself was loved. In this is a disciple unleashed. Is this, in this is the entire law and the prophets. Now how in the world is that possible as I close? Jesus is a beast. I mean, how did you sum up the entire law and the prophets? by telling people to love you. 
Anybody know the Ten Commandments? We got quiet. <laughs> thou shalt have no other. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it. Stop. You notice anything about those first four? They're all about you and God. First four commandments are vertical commandments. Then it goes, honor your mother and your father. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house or anything that is thy neighbor's. He just went horizontal. When he said, love me and love others, he just attacked the entire law. In one fell swoop. The new covenant is not about the list. The new covenant is about love. And so hopefully, after we break huddle, you know, I'm, I'm happy that football season's here. Anybody happy about football season? We 100,000 fans aren't going into Texas Stadium to watch 11 men bend over and have a private conversation. <laughs> they come because they want to know what difference the huddle makes. I want to know, having now huddled, can you now score? What are you going to do about 11 other men on the other side of that ball daring you to go public with that private conversation? Every week, this is a much needed, do not forsake the assembly of the saints, huddle. But the kingdom of God is like, what difference does the huddle make? Yeah. Yeah. Having now huddled, can you now score? Yeah. What are you going to do about the enemy that's waiting, you, waiting for you right outside of that door with what you just learned? Yeah. So I hope from today you don't continue to play the game without the ball. Yeah. Love him. With all your with all your, soul. with all your, Mind. and love and your, neighbor. as your, Self. Awana. <laughs> That's all you needed for the whole law and the prophets. God bless you.